Hello! So good to be here with you uh, in the places that you are, wherever that may be. It's been a, a really great week, blessing, great blessing this week, just to be able to put together a message today that I, I think is, well, for me, was very challenging and encouraging at the same time. And I hope it will be the same for you as well. So I just want to begin by introducing a fellow by the name of Afsh, Afshin Ziafat. I'm going to mess around with that word, but bear with me. Now, Ashvin was born in Houston, Texas, and he grew up in a devout Muslim family. Of course, he was taught the five pillars of Islam, and as Ashvin said in his very own words, quote, if I did them to the best of my ability, then maybe I'd get to heaven. It was a series of interactions with Christians over the years that began a journey for Ashvin toward his decision to follow Jesus. It began in grade two for him. There he was learning English language from a Christian lady who gave him a New Testament and he, hanged, he, kept, on, he kept that New Testament. Of course, he put it somewhere in the bottom of a closet. When Ashvin was a senior in high school, he used the Lord's vein uh, in a game that he was playing and a fellow basketball player came up to him and said to him, Hey, that Jesus, whose name he just said, he's my God. And for a Muslim, Ashvin thought the guy was off his rocker. Because Muslims are taught that Jesus was a prophet, not God. A few days later after the game, Ashvin uh, watched a TV documentary on the life of Jesus. And he learned that some people worship Jesus as God and that those people were called Christians. This brought back Ashvin to his uh, remembrance of grade two and the English language teacher and, and the Bible at the bottom of his closet. And he began to read the New Testament every night, hiding underneath his covers with a flashlight so that his father would not see him. At school during lunchtime, a Christian students, friends would tell Ashvin about Jesus. And back again, reading under the covers, he came across Romans chapter 3, verse 22. And he was struck by Paul's teaching there that righteousness comes to a person apart from the law, apart from what anyone can do for God. And this was a pivotal moment in Ashvin's understanding of who Jesus is. For God's righteousness was made available for all people, regardless of ethnicity or social background or economic background. And that was striking for him because he was taught that one who was born a Muslim is always a Muslim. One time Ashvin was invited to an evangelistic meeting by a friend and there the gospel was proclaimed. And, and it was at that event that Ashvin gave his life to Christ. He decided to follow Jesus. But his journey began for, uh, toward Christ a long time ago. You've heard most of it in grade two with his English language teacher and the New Testament that he received, the fellow basketball player who was a Christian on the court, the documentary about Jesus, the lunchtime conversations, and uh, no doubt many other times throughout his life until he made that commitment. And once he made that commitment, he realized that he would need to tell his family, especially his father, for his father to him was the most important person in his life. He loved him dearly. He tried to hide his faith at first. He you know, hid his Bible, snuck out to church, but eventually his father found his Bible. And the conversation went something like this. What's going on, son? You seem different. Dad, I'm a Christian. No, you're not. You are a Muslim. Dad, the Bible says if I trust in Christ alone for my salvation, I'm a Christian. And I do, Dad. Ashvin, if you're going to be a Christian then you could no longer be my son. Ashvin records that he wanted to say, forget it, I'll be a Muslim. You see, he didn't want to lose his relationship with his father. But he said, if I have to choose between you and Jesus, then I choose Jesus. And at that very moment, Ashvin's father disowned him. So please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to pick, up, uh, pick it up in verse 13 and read it to the end of the chapter. Verse, uh, Matthew 16, verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? 
And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and on the third day he raised, be raised. Verse 22, And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay, repay each person according to what he has done. Verse 28, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this uh, Matthew 16. We thank you for this wonderful gospel. Uh, your revelation to us, to the world. Help us, O oh Lord, by your spirit to understand this and this context so far removed from us. Help us to grasp even the small details as your spirit uh, impacts us in our hearts and minds. And then from there, Lord, help, it, help us to let it percolate in us, help it to address those things in our own lives, that this will challenge us, no doubt, greatly in many ways. And Lord, would you bring us to the place where we would be fully trusting in you, fully committed to you, willing even to give up our own lives if needs be. Those are hard things, Lord. Those are hard things. And we think about relationships that we just heard about this former Muslim man. Lord, this is hard stuff. We ask you to help us understand it and to help us to live it. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are, uh, second uh, message in the series, The Hard Sayings of Jesus. And certainly uh, this text that we just read together uh, certainly has some hard things to ponder. As we look at math, Matthew 16 in the context, here at verse 13, this is a turning point in the ministry of Jesus. There's a major transition for Jesus, but not only for him, but for his disciples as well. Jesus was at the height of his popularity. We can go back to chapter 14. We see how this all was working up until this point. Here in chapter 14, we have the account of Jesus healing the sick and, and, the, and the feeding of thousands with only five loaves and, and two fish and Ended up with some leftovers, 12 baskets full, matter of fact. In the very same chapter, uh, Jesus goes to a place called Genesaret, and, and he was recognized by many there, the text tells us, and they brought Jesus all who were sick, and he healed many. We go to the next chapter, 15. We have the encounter of Jesus and the Canaanite woman. Somehow she heard that Jesus was in the region, and this woman, a Gentile, came running to Jesus with tears streaming down her eyes, and said to him, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. You find that in the 22nd verse of Matthew 15. Some words were exchanged between Jesus and the Canaanite woman. And then Jesus healed her daughter, the text tells us, instantly. But Jesus no sooner left that area, the crowds found him again. And the text tells us they brought to Jesus the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet. And according to the text, the crowd wondered about all that Jesus was doing, and they glorified the God of Israel. 
My friends, Jesus wasn't done. The text tells us that Jesus, with great compassion, was unwilling to send all these people away, the thousands, without feeding them. For he did not want them to faint from hunger on their journey. For they had been with him for three days without no food. And friends, on that day, the lame walked again, the sick were healed, demons cast out, and thousands were fed with seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. And again, there were leftovers, seven baskets full. You know, there's so much that we need to say, but don't have the time in this time period here to say about all this marvelous revealing of the story of God's redemptive plan through history. So much about the nature of God, so much about the nature of man. So many things we just talked about in a brief scope here that would take months, maybe even years of Sundays to walk through and preach through. There's so much there. Friends, God had come in the flesh to reveal himself to his people, to his creation. This was not an idol of wood or stone. This was not some idea conjured up in the mind of some philosopher or some magician or something And back in those days. It was God in the flesh walking among his creation. And one word for today will have to suffice to describe all that Jesus had done for these people when he was on this earth. Compassion. All that Jesus has done for you and me. Compassion. Yes, Jesus was popular. But he's also compassionate. He was compassionate. He didn't uh, bow to the popularity, but with that popularity, his message came with those who opposed him, especially the religious leaders of Israel. And even here in verse 20, we get the sense that Jesus really didn't want to confront them until a certain time. He would say to someone, Don't tell anyone that Jesus, that he was the Christ. Verse 20, we saw that there. But things were about to change. Jesus took his disciples 25 no- miles north of Galilee, away from the opposition that was happening, to the district of Caesarea, 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 okay, forget that, Philippi, verse 13, to the mount, base of Mount Hermon. This was Gentile country, and it was the home base, if you will, of the worship of pagan gods. It was here that Jesus asked his 12 disciples about his identity. He said, who do people say I am? And John the Baptist, they said, Elijah, Jeremiah, or some other prophet. Verse 14. Then Jesus asked his disciples a direct question. Who do you say I am? That's in verse 15. And Peter, speaking on behalf of the rest, said, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah the son of the living God. And it's an interesting thing to to consider this. There they are in Gentile country, uh, really at the temple of the worship of gods, the the Mount of St. Hermon, of Mount Hermon. Think about the history of that mount. See, they worshiped what Paul was, Peter was saying was, you are the son of the living God, not these idols. But anyways, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God, verse 16. And again, time does not allow us to deal with verse 16 to 20 as comprehensively as we should. But two quick points, two quick important points, I would say. One, Peter confessed his personal faith and trust in Christ here to God the Son, the promised Messiah of God, as revealed by God the Father. See, Peter's heart was regenerated by divine inspiration. That's the only way it's going to happen for anybody. Two, Peter was not the first pope as Roman Catholicism teaches. And nor was Peter, as many Protestants, many evangelicals would say, was simply stating his confession of faith. There is more here. For the context of the four Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles in the early church, you can read the, what was happening there in the book of Acts. And the language that's used here, the grammar and the language that's used here in verse 17 to 20, points to what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.20. 2 verse 20 that clearly states that his church will be built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. You see the metaphor there. One commentator put it so well for us. Peter was one rock among a quarry of rocks. Peter was one of 12 apostles that Christ built his church on. See, I don't want us to miss out the importance of what Peter 
of Peter's confession of Christ, but I also didn't want us to miss out the place of his confession in church history, in the church today. But the larger point has been made, I think. Jesus was at the height of his popularity. popularity. His 12 disciples had come closer to understanding who Jesus was at any other point of time up to this time. But Jesus wasn't done. You know, friends, we have the benefit of the gospel record right here before us. We can see it for ourselves. We can read it for ourselves. From this point on, Jesus would begin to tell his disciples that he would go to Jerusalem and face opposition head on. And in doing so, Jesus said he would suffer many things, that he would be killed and on the third day be raised. You see that in verse 21. And immediately we see that as much as Peter and the rest of the disciples understood Jesus, got Jesus, they still had a long way to go. For Peter, who with one breath confessed Jesus as the Messiah, said to Jesus, in what I believe a better sort of way to translate verse 22, may God be merciful to you, let it not be so. More of a gentle way, I suppose. Yet Jesus turned to Peter and the disciples and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Consider with me what author John Bloom said about this particular event. Quote, It was a moment of euphoria for the disciples. Jesus was the Christ. Peter had confessed it and Jesus had confirmed it. The long-awaited arrival of Israel's Messiah had come, and the twelve apostles were at the center of it. No doubt Peter would have been shocked, stunned, but why Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. Because what is so wrong with wanting a Messiah who would remove the Roman oppressors, who would give Israel its freedom? It would return uh, Israel to its glory. But that was the problem. It was the wrong thinking about the Messiah. It was the wrong thinking about Jesus' ministry and his mission. Peter and the disciples were not setting their minds on the things of God. Their minds were on the things of man. We go back to chapter 4 of Matthew's Gospel. Just before Jesus called his first disciples, including Peter would be in there. He was fasting for 40 days and nights, and there in the desert he was tempted by Satan. And it went something like this, to really to be kind of uh, swift through this. You can read Matthew 4 for yourself. This is kind of what happened. In Jesus, you don't have to suffer on the cross. You don't have to die such a brutal death. You can skip that. God will be merciful to you. You can have all the kingdoms of the world just bow down to me. So let me ask, how about you? Is your mind set on the things of God or on the things of this world? Are you seeking the benefits and the blessings of God or are you seeking to know God? Are you a stumbling block to the things of God? Some things we need to learn and we need to learn them very well. Friends, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. You won't find it at the end of the fishing pier, fishing rod in hand. You won't find it in your investments. You won't find it in your pensions. You won't find it in your family. You won't find it in your spouse. You won't find it in your relationships. You won't find it in fame, popularity, or wealth. You won't find it anywhere in this world. Some of you might remember the last week we dealt with Matthew chapter 5, 13 and 14. And there Jesus was talking about the wide gate and the narrow gate. The wide gate is the easy way, Jesus said, and leads to destruction and many enter it. The narrow gate is the hard way. It's the way of opposition. The entrance to the kingdom of God is the way of opposition. It is the hard way that leads to life and few find it, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. We talked about Matthew 10, I'm sure, sometime in the last little while. We go back to Matthew 10, and there we see that Jesus had settled on his 12 his apostles. You see the list there. Then he sends them out with the power to heal every disease and cast out all the demons. He warns them that the suffering and persecution would find them, for the enemy 
is far more powerful than any person, king, or Roman Empire. He told them not to fear anyone or anything, but to fear only the one who could destroy both body and soul in hell. He told them that he didn't come to bring peace but a sword. You see, some will decide for Jesus, and some will decide against, even our family members. And if you love your father more than Jesus, your mother more than Jesus, you will not be worthy of Jesus. For he said, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 10, 37 and 38. And here in Matthew 16, Jesus repeats himself at verse 24 and 25. We remember this is a place where his disciples had come along much further in their understanding of who Jesus is. But it certainly didn't make it any easier for them. Remember, this was a turning point in Jesus' ministry. His eyes were now set on Jerusalem, laser focused on Jerusalem and his crucifixion. It wasn't easy for Jesus, and it certainly wasn't easy for the disciples to take. Jesus was asking his disciples to move toward death, purposefully and intentionally. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, in verse 24. And we are so limited, I don't even know how to express that, in our understanding of how offensive the cross was in Jesus' day. Nobody would have worn a cross around their neck. For the cross of days were on the neck as some cool accessory, some bling, some fancy, shiny thing. But to the first century Jew and Gentile, the cross meant only one thing, death. The cross was an instrument of execution. It was a painful and torturous way to die. I don't think we understand that. But this brings up a really important question. Who gets to define what a true follower of Jesus is? Who gets to define what a true follower of Jesus is? You, me, the culture, denominations, philosophy, politicians. Who gets to decide or gets to define what a true follower of Jesus is? There's only one answer. Jesus does. And Jesus does this for us here in three ways in verse 24. One, a true follower of Jesus must deny himself. The phrase, let him deny, in the original is an emphatic verb. It means to deny utterly. Deny utterly. Utter, utter, utter denial. Deny what? Anyone and everything. Anyone and everything that will compete with Jesus' kingdom. We're reminded in Mark 10 of the rich young man who was committed to teaching, keeping the Ten Commandments. He was faithful in that, he said. Jesus knew this, that he was genuinely seeking the kingdom of God. Yet Jesus said this to him in Mark 10, 21. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Well, we know that the rich man, young a man went away sorrowful. Why? Why did he go away sorrowful? Well, he, what he, he valued his possessions, my friends, over the kingdom of God. He was not able to deny utterly the one thing that competed with Jesus' kingdom. What is competing in your life for the kingdom of God? Two, a true follower of Jesus must carry his cross. We need to understand how Offensive it was to the first century Jew and Roman. You need to really understand that. To understand what it means to carry your own cross. We go to Luke 14 and there Luke records for us a moment when Jesus was sur surrounded by many who wanted to follow him. Read it for yourself. But he challenged them with, ver with some very hard things he said. He said, Things about hating their own fathers and their own mothers and wives and children and brothers and sisters, even their own lives in order to be a disciple of his. And many would not be able to understand that and many would be offended by that. And many thought it is impossible in his day and it is the same in our day. 
I think we often forget about Jesus' own, own, own family who objected and even ridiculed Jesus for his message and his ministry. Yes, some eventually came round and became disciples of Jesus. Jesus surely loved his family dearly. Yet even his family wouldn't deter Jesus from the scourging on his back, the suffering and the death on the cross. What is your cross to carry? Maybe it was the same as Afshin. Denied by his father, shunned by his father and his family. Maybe it's something else, but friends, a true follower of Jesus must carry the cross if they want to be a true disciple of Jesus. Three, follows logically. Follows logically after one and two. A true follower of Jesus must follow Jesus. Here in our text, Jesus challenged the disciples to follow him to Jerusalem. They were not any under delusion what would happen to Jesus if he went there. But Jesus ups the ante, if you will. He says, follow me to your own crosses. When we look at the Bible, we have only one recorded death of an apostle. We find that in Acts 12 too. That's where James was killed by Herod with a sword, by a sword. Tradition, though, supports that all the apostles were martyred except John, who died of an old age. But he was persecuted. Friends, a true follower of Jesus, as verse 25 and 27 points out, trades his life for Jesus' sake. It's a paradox. It's the kingdom's view, not the world's view. And many of ours don't understand, and of us don't understand it. We trade our lives for Jesus' sake. A true follower will lose his life in order to find it, Jesus said. Verse 26 cannot be any clearer. There is no eternal profit if one gains the whole world. If you and I sell our souls to the world, what gain would that be? No, we would just simply forfeit our souls. So in the language of business, what is the bottom line? What is the bottom line, folks? Friends, here it is. Jesus demands total commitment, even your very life. And a gospel message that doesn't call one to full surrender is no gospel at all. And the evidence of salvation must and will be the result of self-renouncing faith. And for those that follow Jesus in this way, there will be a rich reward for them waiting. I want to read uh, uh, from an article that Afshin wrote. He's now a pastor in Texas. Just on a side note, he um, established a relationship with his dad and he prays for his dad's salvation. But this is what Ashfin said in closing. What has Jesus cost you? I'm passionate for people to know that there's a cost to following Jesus. What is it costing you to follow him? It might be the same thing you're holding on to is the a, is a thing that's keeping you from living for his glory. For me, it was my dad. For you, it might be something else. See, there's a huge difference between being a follower of Christ and merely, and merely giving mental assent to the truths about Jesus. The call across Christ isn't simply believe the right things about me, but follow me. And following Jesus is defined by losing your life. It is laying down your dreams, your pursuits, your idols to grab a hold of the greatest treasure in life, Jesus. When we lose our lives, God will leverage our lives for this glory, for his glory, and for others to know Jesus. There's no greater joy and fulfillment in life than this. Let us pray. Father, the challenge is deep here. This is a, a call to a really deep look at our hearts and our intentions, and our understanding of who you are, Jesus, and what it means to follow you. Thank you, Lord, for Afshin, that he was able to reunite with his father, that he pastors a church. In Texas, we thank you for all that is happening in and through his life for your glory. We thank you, Lord, for all who we know that are living a life totally committed to Christ. Help us, Lord, to understand this and what its implications are for us. 
And Lord, may we not just think about it, may we do something about it. It begins by praying and asking you, Holy Spirit, to search our hearts, to know our deep, innermost, hidden parts. And help us, Lord, to surrender all those things that are in the way of truly following you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed day. Shalom.